Father, we thank you for this time together and just pray over your people. Pray that you speak to them through your word and uh, that you bless them uh, with encouragement or conviction or whatever it is that is needed. For we know that your spirit does not return to you void, but it accomplishes what you send it out to do. And uh, we just pray that we can be filled with your word and in spite of everything that is uh, looming around us and we can have confidence and trust in you. And uh, we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. All right, uh, children up to the age of three can go to the back. Somebody back there with them. And I guess this is our uh, hurricane ride out team, huh? <laughs> Hear that phrase everywhere. So uh, the, these are the people who are going to ride it out and trust in the Lord. And fittingly, um, Uh, The title of our sermon is The Lord is Our Strong Tower, and uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 1, uh, verses 6 through 11 today. I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to read the passage first, and then we'll get into the introduction. It says, uh, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, Behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And that is the word of the Lord. Amen. All right, so as far as an introduction goes, we talked about last week, Uh, Luke is the one who wrote the book of Acts, at least the majority agree to that, and Acts begins as a continuation of the gospel of Luke. It makes sense if it's the same writer, so there's consistency there. In the book of Luke, he gave testimony to the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, so that whenever he ends Luke, uh, and as he begins the book of Acts, we see that in the very first five chapters. Uh, He recaps what he already wrote in in the book of Luke. And again, in the book of Acts, he gives testimony that Jesus lived, that he died, and that he rose from the grave. And he also explained how Jesus gave special instructions to the apostles and how that set them apart from everybody else. That's why the apostles are considered the leaders of the church, and they had gifts that others did not have. And then he explained how Jesus told the disciples um, to wait on the promise of the Father. And we talked about what the promise of the Father was. The promise of the Father was the Holy Spirit. And he said to wait on the promise of the Father before they left Jerusalem. So those are the three main things that we discussed last week. Well, our passage today, it actually goes back in time. And I, I think our culture is used to this because if you're a movie watcher, it seems like now you have movies that they'll start at a certain point and then there's a scene that jumps back to kind of give you the full story and then it jumps back forward again. And then, so throughout the movie, you may see that a couple times where it's jumping back and forth. I'm glad they didn't have that whenever I was six years old because I'd be lost, right, back then. But now it's it's pretty normal to us. We're used to that, going back and forth and we can follow the plot, we can follow the storyline. And so that's exactly what Luke is doing here. He introduces this book, gives a recap of what he talked about in Luke or how he finished the gospel of Luke. And then all of a sudden he goes back in time a little bit and focuses on what Jesus did and said to the believers before his ascension. Now, I think what's awesome about today is that we get to peek into this amazing moment when Jesus gave the disciples, his, his final address. Uh, that, that's pretty amazing. And then after that, we see that he ascends into the clouds and he's hidden from them. So that's a wonderful moment that we get to read in Scripture. Now, the reason why it's wonderful is because there's a lot of comfort there. 
Uh, there's a lot of comfort that this passage provides about, number one, our present circumstances, but also, number two, about our future. And uh, that's, that's where we need the comfort, right? What, with what's going on here and now and everything, everything in your life. You need comfort for what's going on here and now, the uncertainty, the issues, the trials, all those things. Uh, but then you also need hope for the future. And these, this passage that we are going to study today provides both of those. Um, if, if there's a sermon summary, it's, it's this. The, the fact that we can trust God because he is God and we are not. Okay? We can trust God because he is God and we are not. We need that to sink in today. Because we need to stop worrying about things that are out of our control. We need to stop that, and we need to learn how to trust God from this moment on. Even if you've struggled with trust in the past, it, it takes one firm stand to start trusting in the Lord, despite whatever it is that you're facing today. So... We need to know that we can trust him because he is God and we are not. So there are three points. And, yeah, this is a, the typical Baptist uh, sermon today, three-point sermon. Um, and they're all dealing, all these points are dealing with trust. And as we look at, you know, verses 6 and 7, that will show us our first point. Verses 6 and 7, the way I, the, the application I want to give you out of those two verses is that we can trust God because he is sovereign. That's why we can trust him. And it goes back to the sermon summary. We can trust God because he is God. And, and to be God is to be sovereign. To take the God's sovereignty away from him is to make him not God anymore. And so we need to understand what that word means. Sovereign is sovereign over everything, in control over everything. Uh, you have everything in the palm of your hands. To have power, dominion, everything, over everything. That's what sovereignty means. It, and, and our own personal lives are not excluded from that. Okay? God is not powerless against us at all. When it comes to faith, salvation, our will, he's not powerless at all against us. Uh, God is the one who determines everything in our lives. That may have you scratching your head this morning and you, because you're thinking about, well, I'm dealing with this, 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 and this. Yeah, God is sovereign over your lives and everything... If you're in Christ, everything that you're dealing with is for a purpose. And that purpose is for his glory and your good. And that's plain and simple. Now, how it's all going to work out, I can't tell you that. You don't know that, but God does. So we can trust God because he is sovereign. As we look at this situation, this has to be the lowest point of the disciples' lives. Uh, because they've been with Jesus this whole time and in their eyes, he's been murdered, he died, of course, if he was murdered, I guess he died, and then he was buried, right? So he was murdered and then buried. At this point, uh, they were ashamed of, ashamed of, the cells because, uh, of themselves because they were deserters of their master, and then also, at this point, they were enemies of the government. They were in hiding, they were running. Uh, the same people who murdered their master, their teacher, wanted to kill them. So they were uh, on the most wanted list, right? So at this point, this is their lowest point. Now, the highlight, on the other hand, was that they found out that Jesus rose from the grave. That changed everything for them. I think at that moment, they started to understand all these different things that Jesus had taught them, especially about himself, who he was, and what he was here to do. I say they started to understand because there, there are clues in the Bible that tell us that they really didn't fully understand. And, and we're going to read one of them here in a minute. So, now that Jesus was back, they remembered his promises about the coming of his kingdom, and they also remembered, oh yeah, we get to rule with Jesus. Jesus says that we get to rule with him. So naturally, here's the first question in verse 6. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So this is after Jesus rose from the grave, and he had fellowship with them for 40 days before he ascended into heaven. Okay, so when they see him, 
this seems to be the first question they have for him. Hey, Lord, remember what you said before? Uh, you're going to be king over everything and we're going to rule with you? When, uh, are we going to do that around lunchtime or when is that going to happen? And as far as we know, the disciples were mainly concerned with an earthly rule. And also um, just being able to have that privilege being at the right hand of Christ as he's ruling over the world, so to speak. So they were worried about the earthly rule of Israel all over the world. Now this is where I say they didn't fully understand the spiritual nature of the kingdom of God. If this is where Jesus is playing chess and everybody else is playing checkers, right? That's how the old saying goes. You really don't understand what's going on. You think you do, but you don't. I, that happens to me all the time. I don't know if it happens to you. The reason why they did not understand, again, this points back to the fact that they are not God. Neither are we. There's a big difference between the two. Uh, listen to this out of the Bible. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. That was written in the Old Testament to the Old Testament people. But that also applied to the New Testament and the New Testament people. And guess what? It applies to you as well. well. When you read that, it should be personal. For my thoughts, God's thoughts, they're not your thoughts. Neither are your ways his ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are God's ways higher than your ways. And his thoughts higher than your thoughts. That brings comfort to me because there are a lot of things that go on in this brain, a lot, right? Big head, big brain. And not all of it is good. Some of it I'm ashamed of. The lack of faith that I have in a sovereign God. The fact that I try to put more control or try to gain more control over my circumstances and situations. I try to figure out everything I can about it, solve it, and then get the glory for it. Now, I may not be, that might not be going on in my head as far as like thinking that, but that's my ultimate motive. It's important that we remember that God is God and we are not. That's especially important to know that this passage out of Isaiah 55 verses 8 through 9 is important to know whenever we are doubting whenever we are fearful, or even when we are questioning God. His ways are higher above, or his ways are, are above our ways, and his thoughts above our thoughts. Now, Jesus answers their questions, and in doing so, he demonstrates the sovereignty of God to do as he pleases. Look at verse 7. He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. By his own authority. In other words, don't worry about the details. Trust God and be faithful to what he has called you to. I've tried to simplify my life to that level. Because I feel like as I think about things, I worry about things, or concerned about things, whatever, however you want to phrase it, I find that I do that whenever I start worrying about the details of everything. And God has control of the details. Now, that's very hard for me to say because I want to make sure everything's covered. I think as a husband and father and as a pastor, I, I think it's, it's in within the realm of my responsibility to make sure things are covered, uh, to make sure things are being looked at from, from an overall perspective. But it shouldn't be looked at... In, in so much detail that I get anxious or worried about things that I, I cannot control. To those things, I have to trust God and I have to be faithful to what God has called me to do. If, if, if I'm doing both of those things, then I'm doing what I need to do. Now, we say, well, what does it mean to trust God? Well, it, let's define the word trust. To trust something is to have a firm belief in the 
reliability, the truth, ability, or the strength of someone or something. I'm going to read that again. To trust something is to have the firm belief in the reliability, the truth, ability, or strength of someone or something. Think about your trust in the Lord. Do you fully trust in his reliability? Do you fully trust in his truth, his ability, or his strength? I think that's a good question for ourselves. Because we say we trust the Lord, but let's categorize it. What areas do we trust the Lord and what areas do we not? That comes out in our anxiety. That comes out in our fear. That comes out, comes out in our doubt. Trusting God is difficult. We know that. Why? Because it's scary not being in control of your situation. Trusting someone else is also difficult. Why? Because people have failed us. But you know who the hardest person to trust is? Yourself. And that's where we go all the time. We think, well, I can trust myself because I won't let myself down. Mm, let's be honest. Trusting ourselves is impossible. Not only difficult, but it's impossible. Why? Because we have failed others. Remember, we're worrying about others failing us. Well, we have failed others. We have failed God and we have failed ourselves. We're the worst person to trust. So, trusting God is the only viable option in the grand scheme of things. You see, the reason why it's hard for us to trust God, it's not that he will fail us. Remember what I said. I said it's hard to trust God because you feel like you're not in control. You can get that out of your mind right now. You're not in control anyways. You're not in the driver's seat. You're not, you're not giving the will over to God. You're not doing any of that. God is in control. He is sovereign. And he is the one who rules over his creation. So trusting God is the only viable option. He alone is perfect in everything that he does. Listen to this out of the London Baptist Confession of Faith. God, the good creator of all things, in his infinite power and wisdom, upholds, directs, arranges, and governs all creatures and things. From the greatest to the least, by his perfectly wise and holy providence, to the purpose for which they were created. He governs according to his infallible foreknowledge and the free and unchangeable counsel of his own will. His providence leads to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, infinite goodness, and his mercy. Man, that's so awesome. God is so good. And that's why we can trust him. He has everything, everything that he needs within himself. And he is all that we need. Today... As we look upon our situation, everyone is forced to trust God because we're powerless against this storm. What is it going to do? Where is it going to go? What time is it going to get here? What time is my power going to shut off? All these different things. Um, while preaching on Psalm 91.4, this is what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, they know the storm. He said the following, they know that the storm has a bit in its mouth. And that God holds it in and nothing can hurt them. Nothing can happen to them but what God permits. This storm that's approaching us, this literal storm has a bit in its mouth. It's controlled by God. But figuratively, figuratively every problem, trial, every storm in your life has a bit in its, bit in its mouth also. And that is being controlled by God. We must always trust God because he is God and he has shown to be good to us. Psalm 13, verse 5. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. 
Second point, verses 8 through 9. We can trust God because he is with us. That, that's an awesome promise that we have, and we see that in verses 8 through 9. In verse 8, Jesus promises the coming of the Holy Spirit to the church. Now, this promise would be fulfilled in Pentecost, or at Pentecost. As soon as the disciples received the Holy Spirit, we see that they were divinely empowered to fulfill their calling. Uh, they went from these guys who were like Peter, for example. Peter is just rash to make decisions, rash to speak. He was the one who was willing to speak up, which is an admirable quality, but he was always sticking his, I don't know, sandal in his mouth, I guess, right? He was always in the wrong. He was speaking too soon. He's the one who was rebuked by Christ. And then all of a sudden, Jesus rose from the grave, ascended into heaven, told them to go wait, in, to, to go wait um, do not leave Jerusalem for the, until they receive the promise of the Father. Once they receive the promise of the Father, Peter's the very first one to get up and, and, and preach a very powerful sermon. And we know Peter's history. That was not Peter. That was Peter filled with the Holy Spirit speaking the word of God to his people. This empowerment was not only for the apostles, but it was for all of the church. Of course, they received a different gift, or at least a different amount of gifts. But yet, the Holy Spirit lives in us. He has gifted us. And he is here to help us, encourage us, lead us, anything that we need. He is there. And so how can we be the husband we need to be or the wife we need to be? Or how can we be the parents we need to be? How can we be the grandparents we need to be? How can we be the pastors we need to be? Uh, well, it's not by our strength, but it is by the spirit of the Lord. He's the one who directs us. He's the one who helps us. He's the one who gives us what we need when we need it. So Peter speaks about this in his first sermon, how it's available to all who repent and are baptized. Acts 22, verse 38. This is Peter's address after he speaks, after he preaches. And then they say, well, what shall we do? He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you are in Christ today, you are empowered by the Holy Spirit. If you are in Christ today, you are not alone. God is in you. Is anybody awake out there? Anybody. That's pretty exciting. We need to remember that. Because, you know... It, you talk to different people about what's going on. Uh, you know, I had a conversation with my neighbor yesterday. Uh, the uncertainty of this storm, it's just kind of like going different ways. It's, you know, it, it's not falling wherever they said it was going to fall. It might be a category one, two, three, category 50. We don't even know after by the time it gets here, right? And so neighbors like, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know if to go here, go there. What are you guys going to do? You know, told them our plan. And that didn't help them at all, right? And, and so, that, but that's, that's the true situation. Everybody is kind of like that. Like, I, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know if I'm capable of making the decision. I don't want to make the wrong decision, this, this, and that. We feel that way a lot of times, and a lot of times we just need to stop, and we need to pray, and we need to seek God's counsel. We need a clear head. Like, there, there's just so many things coming at us. If, if you're on Facebook or Twitter or anything else and you're looking at all the different projections, like, just stop. Yeah, it's already coming. <laughs> if you're here, you're here. But the fact is, is that, you know what? There's great encouragement and great wisdom in the counsel of God. Seek his word. Depend on his spirit. Know that you're not alone. He, he is here with you. And remember, everything you do has a purpose. God has a bit in your mouth, as well as everything that's going on around you. 
This is the awesome promise that we get with Jesus leaving. Without Jesus leaving, the Holy Spirit wouldn't have come. It was for our good that Jesus ascended into heaven. He said it himself, John 16, 7. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go. For I do not go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. What is the helper here to do? He's here to help. The spirit is the constant presence of God in us. And we'll, we'll preach on this a little bit more as we go along. But here are the highlights. He works through us and around us to bring about God's will. He enlightens us concerning sin and salvation. He equips us with spiritual gifts to serve God. He comforts us. He convicts us. He helps us to understand God, to understand God's word. He leads us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow God. He does all those things. It's comforting to know we're not alone. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he began his work interceding for the church. That's a big word. What does it mean to intercede? It means to intervene on behalf of someone else. Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Romans 8, 34. On one hand, we have Satan. He's the accuser. He accuses us. On the other hand, we have Jesus. Not only is he our Savior, but he's interceding for us. 1 John chapter, one, uh, chapter 2. I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin we have an advocate with the father jesus christ the righteous with the ascension jesus received the glory he had before the incarnation he's seated at the right hand of god and is a constant mediator between god and the church here's the reason why i bring that up i, I want you to know that god is completely with you so we talk about God in us with the Holy Spirit. That means he knows us better than anybody else. His presence, he has an imminent presence with us. Wherever we go, he goes. We cannot be separated from him. When we go through difficult times, Christ is there. When we are at the peak of our lives, he is there. So he's in the, in the valleys and he's at the mountaintops. He's there with us. But sometimes, at least from a, creature per, a creaturely perspective, sometimes we're so involved with something that we miss something else because we don't have an overall picture of things. We don't have overall control of things. Sometimes people who are looking at our situation from an outside perspective can help us because they can see what we can't. We're too far into the weeds. But see... God is not like us. Again, he can be in us, and then he can be over us at the same time. And that is something very special. That is something that should be very comforting to us. So God is not only imminent, but he's also transcendent. That's why we can trust him. He has us covered at every single angle he is a constant presence in our lives. And then the very last thing is that we can trust God because he will return. Now, how cool is that? Think about what I've just said. Point number two was you can trust God because he is with you. But at the same time, I can say you can trust God because he will return. That's like, right? He is with us, but yet he's going to return. And, and that's not confusing to us. We're like, yeah, that makes sense to me. But think about an unbeliever who does not understand the nature of God, does not understand the Trinity, that God can be in heaven and he can be in you. So we have God who is in us, who will never leave us, but then we also have God who's going to return and take us to be where he is. We serve an awesome God. 
When we look at the ascension, it marked the beginning of the last days. Right now, you're living in the last days. The only thing we wait for now is his return. Listen to this out of John chapter 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. That's a great funeral verse. That's, that's one of the verses that is, is always recited during a funeral. But it's good that we read that before we die, right? That's what it's meant for. That verse is meant for those who are alive at a funeral. The person who has died, if they died in Christ, they're already at that place. Be encouraged by this verse. The same God who lives in you is the same God who will return for you and take you to be where he is at. That is the great hope of the church, is that one day the Lord will come back to save us from sin and death. On that day, the Bible tells us that Satan, that Satan will be vanquished, sin will be wiped away, creation will be restored, and the best thing of, the best thing of all is that we shall see him again, or we shall see him face to face. Be ready. He will come back the same way he went into heaven. That's what we read in verse 11. The... the Disciples were all looking up. I can't imagine what, you know, the sight that they saw, but they're just looking up. Jesus just elevates and keeps on going and keeps on going and then just disappears. And they're in disbelief, just looking up. And then appear, then there are those who appear before him. And they say, hey, this Jesus, he's going to come back in the same way that he left. In other words, it's time to get to work. It's time to be faithful, to trust God and be faithful on the calling he has given you. And on that day, we understand scripture to say that every eye will see him and every knee will bow. We can trust God because he is our strong tower. No matter what is happening in our lives, he is in us and all around us. He is sovereign, and he does everything for his glory and our good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. Just thank you for the encouragement your word has provided for us today. Help us to trust you in all the things that we cannot control. For we know we are well equipped uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit for life and godliness. Uh, we desire to serve you. We desire to live for you. Uh, sometimes we battle the flesh, or actually every day we battle the flesh, for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Help us to overcome the desires of the flesh and to do things and pursue things that please you. And help us to trust in you, for we know that as we face various trials, that you are doing something special in us. You are growing us and you are sanctifying us. Uh, you are building steadfastness in us. And once that is complete, we know that we will be, as James says, perfect, and complete, not lacking in anything. So help us to trust you with that. Forgive us of our sins where we fail you and um, help us to, get up, dust our clothes off, and continue to walk in obedience to you. Pray for everyone here and their families as wherever they decide to go, I pray that you keep them safe, that you bless them with, in their time wherever they go and bring them back here safely. We thank you so much for your many blessings, even the trials that we face, for all those things have a purpose. And through all those things, we glorify your name. We thank you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.